Hello. Um, thank you very much for being here. Uh, uh, very excited about the, the entire program, but particularly excited about this panel. Uh, we have here a, 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 a group of people who are very interesting and doing a lot of progress in, 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 a, in a topic that doesn't sound so exciting, but, but once we understand sort of like the deep implications of it, like reporting standards, reporting uh, results in a standardized way uh, in social sciences, particularly in, in, in economics, the, the, the field that I'm most closely associated with, uh, it's, it's deeply important. And that's what we're gonna try to uh, talk about it today. So um, as a motivation, just very quickly, sorry about that. Okay, so, um, yeah, so think think of think of this so like big matrix, a very large matrix, but finite, finite. It's it's important, containing all the possible outcomes and all the possible policies that we would like to discuss. So the the, the um, there's this idea of the evidence gap maps that was uh, uh, developed by 3AE a long time ago, but here uh, more think about evidence gap maps for every single possible outcome for every single possible treatment. And not only counting how many interventions are in there, but actually knowing what is the 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 the, the outcome, the, what is the the measurement of the outcomes, what are the the estimates that are being generated, and being able to access this rather quickly. So, just take one cell there. It, it could be, for example, what is the effect of an additional high school counselor on on on, on student graduation, and it would be fantastic to quickly retrieve that knowledge. So. Things that we should spend a long time on it, uh, maybe our lifetime in, in a subset of these cells. So we could spend a lot of time uh, generating new estimates, discussing how theory could be used to extrapolate those estimates to different settings, discussing the external and internal validity of that, uh, discussing the policy relevancy, all extremely important uh, and, and, uh, and time-worthy endeavors. A very important endeavor, that we should not spend so much time and have so much subjectivity on it's defining where, what is in the infamous cell at any given point. So what do we know at any given point about any of these uh, relationships? It should be much, uh, much, uh, much less expensive in terms of time and much less subjective. Um, so with that as a, as a motivation, we think that, uh, yeah. We think that uh, reporting standards may help in reducing the cost and subjectivity of curating what's currently known. Uh, additionally, the combination of registries uh, with uh, standardized reporting can help to uh, alleviate the file drawer problem when a non-random subset of results is only known, generating publication bias. So th there's a large promise in here, which should be weighted against potential unintended consequences where additional uh, requirements and additional uh, processes might uh, slow down the research process, might uh, bring uh, might require addi additional cost of researchers who have less uh, resources to comply with different requirements. So we need to have that conversation. Um, and basically, uh, we, we want to talk about that. Th this, these are issues that have been well discussed and well debated in the biomedical sciences for a while. There, there has been important progress in, in, in that space. Some of it in the social sciences, but but uh, uh, until now there has not been that much uh, um, uh, discussion of this, uh, particularly in, in economics, uh, and and we think that at bits from bits we think we think that there's a a wave of solutions that are emerging on this space. We think that the, there's different actors who are playing uh, important roles in this space, and we wanted to have a a subset of those uh, actors here in this panel, so. With that, uh, I wanted to uh, start the conversation with Graham Blair, who will go briefly, who will briefly introduce a, a schema designed to standardize reporting standards of RCTs, uh, and how they are, those that schema has been currently implemented in the Impact uh, Data uh, and Evidence uh, Aggregation Library, IDEAL, to create a library of development for evidence. Graham is a a associate professor in political science at UCLA and a co-director of training and methods at uh, at evidence in governance, governance and politics. Then we will follow up with Alison Kane, who will discuss her work with Eva Uyalt and others in trying to generate consensus around reporting uh, standards in economics uh, with uh, with an emphasis on external validity. Alison is a PhD student of economics at the University of Toronto 
where she works on applied microeconomics and particularly focus on labor inequality. And then we'll follow up with uh, Jack Cavano, who will talk about the uh, AEA registry, the American Economic Association registry, uh, efforts to connect the registered trials, trials to the subsequent uh, published articles that are generated from those studies. Jack is a research manager at JPAL Global, where he works on research methods and transparency, including managing the AA registry and contributing to other public research goods, such as best practices systems for publishing and documenting social science data. Um, in addition to all this great work, at BITS, we, as mentioned, BITS, uh, Ted mentioned at the beginning, we have been working on, on a project called Reporting Guidelines for Publication Bias, which I will use to inform a little bit the, the conversation and, and bring some of the questions to, to talk about this. So with that, I'll uh, give the word to Graf. Thanks. Um, nice to see everyone. I'm excited to share some work that uh, a number of us in the audience, uh, Sarah Stillman and, and Carson Cristiano, are working hard on, which is to create a library of evidence on uh, research that informs policy in low and middle income countries. And I I'm going to talk about this on this panel about standards because we've both been able to really build on a lot of the recent progress in developing standards for reporting on randomized trials, uh, but we've also come up against some of the real challenges that that remain in this area, that some of which are being addressed um, by, by Allison and Jack. So the problem that we're trying to address is that evidence and data on what works to address social and economic problems in low and middle income countries is really still not accessible to decision makers. And I think as Skip kind of outlined, like this is really our goal. And so the fact that this evidence remains cloistered in academic journals uh, and databases is a big problem. And so we're going to we're trying to attack this in a particular domain in this area of, of informing policy in low and middle income countries. Uh, the second part of it is, is that even for uh, the advisors who have PhDs and can access uh, the evidence from academic journals to inform those uh, policymakers, they still face this really daunting task, which is that each time they're asked to inform a decision, they need to go and read all of these papers, 50 and 60 page papers with 100 and 200 page appendices to pull out what are the findings so that they can inform the policymaker about what decision should be made. And so we want to address uh, both, both of these issues, making this uh, evidence more accessible both to policymakers and and. Uh, the academics and PhDs in implementing organizations that advise them. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so what we're trying to develop is a library of pulling together every randomized trial conducted on a set of substantive domains that are relevant for policymaking in low and middle income countries. And we basically want to collect three things out of each of those studies. We want to collect the interventions that were studied, what was studied, what are the details of the intervention, what combinations of different policies were implemented. We also want to collect the study design. How did they go about answering the question, is this an effective policy? And third, we want to know, what did they find? What is the estimated impact? And what's our uh, what, what's the precision of that estimate? How sure are we? The second thing that we want to do is to then create a platform that can enable both advisors who have PhDs to summarize this evidence and for policymakers to directly access what scientists are finding in the area in which they're working. To do that, um, what we're doing is a very labor intensive hand coding of metadata from each of these trials. And so we're having research assistants, many of whom are based at Berkeley, read each of these studies and pull out a set, uh, pull out these three elements. What are the interventions? What is the study design? And what did they actually find? Um, and in order to decide what to pull out, we had to rely on uh, a set, we had to pick a set of standards that we were going to apply, kind of reverse engineering what the metadata for that study would have been if they had actually uh, followed these standards. And so we picked a set of standards that's developed by, by Jack Kavanaugh uh, and collaborators at JPAL and the World Bank. Um, basically, what they did was to try to think about for RCTs and economics, what are the key dimensions that we would want to pull out in order to understand what was studied, what did they find, and should we believe their findings? 
And so they have a set of fields that they've defined. They have a definition. Um, they have a set of uh, expected responses to that. So what are the randomization units that we're studying? So were you were you studying villages? Were you studying neighborhoods? Were you studying individuals? Were you studying households? And so they put this together into a set of fields that can be collected systematically across all RCTs in economics. And so we're applying this slightly more broadly to uh, RCTs in, in social science. Um, and so that, that's kind of the, the foundation of this effort to collect systematic metadata for each of these studies that can then inform uh, policymakers. To do that, um, we have, it, I guess, just to summarize, it's been really hard. Um, and that's because we're, we have to reverse engineer this. So we have to go back through these papers and we have to look for the information that matches each of these items, which are what, what country, you know, what, what, what country was uh, studied? What, what was the unit of randomization? What were they analyzing? What was the estimate? What was the standard error? That information, number one, isn't all in one place because precisely because these standards don't exist. Uh, and so they're all over the place, from the paper to the appendix, and sometimes they don't even appear there. Some of these details appear only in, for example, the, the pre-registration document. Second, many of the items that we think are quite critical and that, that Kavanaugh and uh, Jack and his co-authors think are quite critical for understanding what was studied and whether it's credible just don't appear in the studies. Uh, and so any of you who have done meta-analysis are familiar with this. It's there often isn't a, a standard error reported or a p-value reported, but there also isn't a reporting of exactly what was done to randomly assign the, the treatment. And so they're just, they're just blanks uh, in, in some of these fields. So I'll kind of come back to what we could do about that um, instead of reverse engineering this kind of forward engineering, uh, applying these standards. This has been really labor intensive. And so one of the things that we're trying to figure out is whether we can use machine learning tools to improve the speed and accuracy of extracting this data. Because we'd like to be able to, just in our narrow domain of, of the kind of policies that affect low and middle income countries and a certain set of domains like crime and violence and, and issues affecting people who've been subject to forced displacement, it's a huge set of studies and we wanna be able to keep it up to date so that when new studies come, uh, come out, they're also included in the data so that when a decision maker goes into our database, they know what the state of the art knowledge is. Uh, and so we're, although we're currently doing this with human RAs, right now we're trying to figure out uh, first, can we discover and filter studies as they come out and just determine whether it's an RCT, whether it fits into our one of our subject domains, and whether it's relevant for low and middle income countries using not having someone read the thousands of studies that are published in social science every day. Uh, second, we're trying to figure out what data we can merge from public and private repositories where other groups have already put together information about studies uh, so that we can not rep duplicate that effort. And third, we're using large language models to try to code particular fields like reading a paper and extracting what the unit of randomization is or what the estimate of the impact was. Uh, and we're going to run a kind of small uh, uh, randomized trial where we experiment with uh, whether we provide that large language model uh, input to a human coder, whether we just have a human coder uh, or whether we just use the machine and assess both the cost and accuracy of those of those three strategies. And our goal is to have this set of tools both that can help us uh, uh, code each of the studies as e each new social science randomized trial as it comes out. And also, I think a lot of these tools will hopefully be useful for other meta analysts in other, um, in other substantive domains. So I think that the last thing that I, that I wanted to say was, was that this is just um, revealed to us or reminded us about all of the challenges of, of reporting on RCTs that really need to be fixed at an earlier stage than the published studies and, and the working papers. And so I think if, if it had been the case that in journal articles and in pre-registrations and in working papers, the set of fields that um, Jack and co-authors define had been reported by the authors, we wouldn't have had to collect any of these. And there wouldn't have been a lot of subjective decision-making that we have to do where we don't have full knowledge of the, of the study details ourselves because we didn't conduct those studies. And so we think that these studies should really be applied at this earlier level. They're already being applied to a certain extent at, the, um, at some of the registries who ask for this uh, set of fields. Um, and I think there's been some progress there. Um, the, second, the second, I think, innovation that we need is to collect, uh, is to connect 
a lot of the machine readable data that different organizations have already been collecting about studies. Uh, and so there have been efforts to collect all of the funding applications, for example, uh, from major donors. And we those, those are being linked to papers that have been published. Uh, collecting conflict of interest and biographical data to understand what are what are the incentives of the researchers who publish this research. Those data already exist. Um, there are databases of retractions, registrations, replication data, working papers that then lead to papers. Um, all of this can can kind of um, simplify the process of collecting this uh, metadata on what what do we know and and how do we know it. Finally. Uh, what this has revealed to us is that we, we really need uh, continued work on standards for reporting, even on RCTs. So J Jack and co-authors work focuses on economics RCTs. And so one of the things we've had to do is figure out what are the kinds of information we would need from studies in other uh, in other disciplines that aren't necessarily relevant in economics, uh, but are relevant in those other fields, but still hew to uh, the same kinds of standards in economics. Um, and we have, and I think a lot of the work that's been done in standards so far has focused on internal validity. What are, how believable are these findings in the context in which they were studied? And I think a lot of, a lot more progress needs to be made as we've seen trying to code this uh, on how much should we believe that these uh, findings uh, travel to other contexts or work for, work for other, in other flavors of this intervention um, or for other outcomes that weren't directly measured in the original outcome. Um, and so Allison will talk a little bit about an effort to do just that. So uh, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so this is some very early work. Uh, that I'm doing with Eva Vivald, as well as lots of other people. Uh, Graham's been involved to some extent too. Um, but it's something that's kind of come out of what's been noticed that there really isn't a standardized kind of reporting in economics in particular, uh, but social sciences more broadly as well. Uh, so as Graham mentioned, you know, sometimes when people are trying to do these meta-analyses, they're having to kind of really dig through papers. Things might not be reported. You're kind of having to go at it backwards. So we're trying to get something that would um, allow researchers before they publish their paper, before they write it, to make sure they're reporting the key kind of variables that people need. So this is sort of inspired by the consort statement, uh, which I think many people are familiar with, this sort of checklist that authors can follow along, uh, more focused towards uh, the medical field, uh, but they can really see, okay, have I reported this? Have I reported that? and not have to uh, worry about omitting something that's really important for other people to use going forward for meta-analyses. So we've got a kind of diverse group of people across uh, economics, but also poli-sci, uh, some different fields, psychology, development, who we've been trying to kind of pick their brains and figure out what is the consensus on what would need to be reported in a checklist. So very much inspired. Um, in part of also by uh, the paper Jack had um, for RCTs and economics, looking at the variables that are required without trying to overburden anyone. So we don't want to have like a super long list where things won't necessarily be applicable. We want to be able to agree on kind of the key elements um, that are necessary. So what's come out of that for meta-analyses, we sort of have reached a general consensus. People tend to agree uh, as Graham said, you know, you need to know what the treatment was, what the effects were, uh, how it was studied. People tend to agree on that. But when we're talking about what's necessary for external validity, we've so far seen, um, even just within not too huge of a group, a lot of disagreement. So there's some things that people really do agree on, um, but also some really broad disagreements. So both in terms of kind of what is important, are we thinking more about the outcomes, or are we thinking more about how the study was designed really early stages or how it was run? Uh, there doesn't seem to be a consensus on what is actually the relevant criteria for determining external validity. Uh, so that's something that we've kind of struggled with uh, as well. 
there's been a lot of disagreement on particular variables. So uh, just kind of an internal poll, we looked at um, like a Likert scale about some of the variables if people thought they were extremely important, a little important, um, and a few kind of outcomes that people might want reported, things like the data collection start and end dates and the sample size justification uh, to look at statistical power. There were some people responding not at all important, so on one end of the scale, while others responded extremely important. Uh, so really huge disagreement there, um, which we're trying to kind of figure out going forward what is the top priority. One thing, though, uh, that did stand out, there seems to be a really huge agreement on the reporting of incremental and fixed costs as being important for external validity. So this was something that really across the board, we had consensus on it being important, which is something that really stands out because this is not one of those things uh, that it is being reported, but in a really unstandardized way. So generally, some things like the location, maybe most people are saying what country uh, they're doing it in. It just might not be uh, in a standardized kind of unit, whereas the costs typically are not reported in most studies. Um, but this is something that people have found really important or are saying at least that they find really important for external validity. So that's kind of something um, that we've noticed really early stages, uh, but we're still kind of working uh, right now in the process of reaching out to some journal editors to figure out what exactly is the most important uh, needs that we have for external validity and what is realistic in terms of actually being able to ask researchers to report it. Um, okay, so I think I'll end it there and Jack. Awesome. Um, thanks everyone for being here today. Thanks Fitz for having us. Um, and thanks for the other pa panelists. This is a super interesting conversation so far. I'm looking forward to hearing more. Um, so this is joint work with a couple of my colleagues at JPAL, uh, Suji Goyle and Sarah Koffer, as well as Larsville Hoover, who's in the audience here. Um, so I'm going to talk today about our efforts at the AARCT registry to increase post-trial reporting for studies. Um, luckily, this is one of the few rooms where I'm not going to have to spend a long time motivating why we care about registries and the social sciences. So I'll instead start with some good news and some bad news. So the good news is that over the 10 years that the AARCT registry has been around, um, both registrations and pre-registrations have seen a pretty uh, marked increase over that 10 years. So we can see we're getting a lot more trials every year and a higher proportion of those trials are being pre-registered. That's the good news. The bad news is that's not all we need in order for registries to fulfill their one of their main goals of combating the file drawer problem. So in order for them to do that, we need the, for them not only to just be a stamp in time, but we need for people to go back and update them with the post-trial, the post-study information. Things like very basic information, like did the trial finish? Was it withdrawn? If so, when did it finish? When did data collection finish, et cetera? And then importantly, what are the links to the other output of the study, the paper, the data, the reports, everything that we're talking about up here on the panel that are like part of the larger ecosystem where people can find out more about what happened in the study uh, if they would like to. This has historically been a problem uh, in registries that are have been established for longer. Um, so DeVito et al. Uh, finds that even for clinicaltrials.gov, which has the mandate of US law behind it, uh, post-trial reporting is really remarkably low, only around 40%. Um, so the question is, how are we doing in social sciences? The answer is not so well so far. Um, so the last motivation here is just a graph at baseline for our study in fall of 2023, what post-trial reporting looked like on the AARCT registry. Um, out of our roughly 6,000 trials that were at least one year past trial end date, 80% um, of them didn't have any post-trial fields filled in. 18% had something and only 1% had all of the fields filled in. So, and this has been what the trends have looked like for the past three or four years. So we saw this and we said, okay, we need to figure out what's going on here. Um, and so we did a two-part study. The first being a qualitative study 
uh, in order to figure out what the barriers are, what the incentives are that people need in order to actually report um, their study outcomes on the registry. And then the second part is informed by that qualitative study, what can we do uh, as the managers of the registry to increase that reporting? So this is the status quo. Um, I won't spend too long on it, but basically right now, uh, before the study, everyone would get one email around their registration end date saying, please update this information. The information we want them to update uh, is a list of about 12 fields. Some of them have some subfields, um, but it's very basic information. What's the trial withdrawn? What are the dates? What does the final, final sample size look like? And then a bunch of links to paper data, et cetera. So for the qualitative study, we took a sample of 48 registrants uh, that are randomly sampled from trials that um, were registered before May 2022 and that were at least one year past their trial end date. Uh, it was a stratified random sample and we overweighted trials that um, had filled in their PTR fields so that we could be able to talk to people that had actually done this. Um, so the sample PIs were sent a self-guided interview and then we had a follow-up semi-structured interview with them as well. Um, the two jointly covered things like the, the uh, PI's experience with registration, the fit, framing and frequency of messages aimed at increasing post-trial updates, attitudes towards research transparency and trial registration, the perceived benefits and hurdles to updated registrations. That was really big for us when we were planning our, our second study. Um, and then finally, just some open-ended feedback on the registry. So what we found from the quality of study was that a low rates of PIs were confident that they had actually seen our nudge email, um, only around 33% there. Um, they had a preference for pre-filled information and a reminder of fields yet to be completed as the most compelling nudges for a reminder email. Journal requirements and perceived benefits to others were the strongest incentives for people to do this. Lack of reward from the field of economics and lack of time and staff to update were the largest constraints that people reported. And then finally, um, and interestingly, uh, in accordance with uh, one of the findings from Christian and Sin et al. in 2019 was that uh, most people in our sample reported that transparent practices were very important to them, but also the largest gap between what they felt was important to them and what they felt was important to the field of economics was on this uh, transparent practices is important to me part. So we take the findings from the qualitative study um, and we design a few nudges um, and apologies uh, if anyone here was in our sample and got a bunch of reminder emails. Um, hopefully you updated your post-trial fields. So the, the three potential arms were a control email, similar to the reminder that I showed a few slides back, just more frequently over the study, a salience treatment that lists the PTR fields that still need to be filled in, and then an incentive treatment that offered a slot in a lottery for anyone that had their complete fields filled in. Um, and we tested this over four months. Randomization was at the trial level, uh, and that allowed for measuring spillovers and dosage effects uh, in this very short presentation. I don't have time to go into the full design of the RCT, um, but shocker, we have a RCT registry entry on it where you can find more about it. All right, so very preliminary results. We just finished in February. Um, so this is just a panel event study that looks at where people actually updating their PTR fields during this time. Um, so we see uh, a jump in November that still stays a little bit in December, January, and February. Uh, it is pretty low. It's a 1% to 3% percentage point increase in the likelihood of updating the trials. Um, what this looks like in flow numbers is we were having roughly 10 to 20 trials update their PTR fields every month before then. During the study in November, we had around 115, 150, and then... For the remaining three months, we are at 50 to 70 trials. So it's not huge, but it is an increase from where we were before. Um, in terms of what actually got people to do that, um, we really don't see that many differences. So uh, our first three effects here are, our first two effects here are against the control. Um, and so we really don't see any uh, uh, significant difference in between the salients or in lottery and control. Uh, what seems to be moving this is just that they're getting the reminder and they're getting it more frequently. Um, likewise, we don't see any significant effects on these spillovers or dosage. Um, with that, uh, I'll go ahead and end and hand it over for Fernando.
Yeah, thank thank you very much, all three, for that uh, very exciting uh, open uh, remarks. Uh, and as you see, that there is the first the first thing we wanted to share is that there's action in this space. That it's action that we were not seeing two, three, five years ago, uh, and it, it it's very exciting to see some of this. Um, the uh, I, I I guess that the the first thing that I would that, that would uh, lead with it's um so what what are the what are the main challenges that you face right now to further expand or successfully complete your initiative uh, and and what 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 would be in the near future for social science registries more generally i don't know um i'm happy to go yeah. Um, so I, I completely forgot my conclusion slide, uh, but one of the things I had there was that we saw that we have some uh, some ability to ability to move reporting just from nudges from some mechanical things. But a lot of what we saw is that that wasn't a huge movement, and um, what people reported over and over again in the qualitative study was that they needed better incentives in order to do that, um, and so what we can do on nudges is limited if we don't have buy-in from these larger incentives like journals requiring this post trial reporting or um funders etc anyone that has the the pull levers um where we have the push ones uh i think one of the things that's i, I think come up in in on the you're asking about the registration side is is that um, the JPL registry has has done a lot of work and thinking on standardizing and and basically asking people to report in a common way on the study design in in the registration. But it's only one of the registries. It's it's the largest one in economics, but it's 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 one of uh, five or six across social science. And when you look across them, there's very little standardization. The same fields are not being collected um, across regist across registries. Um, and the same fields that are being collected are being collected in different ways. Um, it's also very difficult to access the data from those registries. So you can download the uh, CSV that has all of the trials in the AA registry, along with all the details that go with it. Um, but you can't do that for most of the other registries. Uh, in fact, some of them have mostly private registrations, um, and so you can't you can't even look into them. Um, and so one of the motivated by uh, kind of funding crisis in in a couple of the different registries, including the EGAP registry, uh, which serves political science and and other social scientists who are working on governance and politics, um, which actually shut down in November because of a a, a lack of funding, um, is trying to combine kind of combine forces and figure out how we can um, leverage this movement in in standards and apply it to all social science trials that are being registered, so that you could go to a single place and find not only all of the trials that have been uh, planned, but a common set of information about them that that you could then uh, follow up on to see which have been published and which haven't, and and kind of like what have we learned in each of these areas, which currently is because of this lack of standardization and because of this kind of disciplinary um, and research community uh, separation is is currently either either difficult or or kind of impossible. I think on that, there is really this huge difference in terms of, what people from different fields, what people from different journals, uh, different registries think is important. So finding kind of the consensus on what should be the standard uh, has been really difficult and trying to figure out how to make something that's a narrow enough kind of list of things that people are willing to report it. Um, because as Jack kind of pointed out, people are not always uh, filling out fields. So making sure it's not too burdening, but at the same time, having a long enough list that it actually is meaningful and tells us things rather than just saying, report these two fields. Um, we need it to be kind of long enough to make everyone happy, but also not too long. Yeah, the, the, the I, I see a... a, a um... A big tension in, in the way I think in terms of uh, registrations and how so like evidence should be updated in a sense that we, we should so like improve in the margin we should like have uh, or I normatively I think that like a, a new paper should say okay I have same data same methods uh, but uh, or same data same theory but I tried new methods and that that's my paper but usually a paper is more like no, 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 everything is new. Like I'm redefining the world entirely. So it's much harder to, to sort of like, sort of like 
pin down exactly where, where how do you aggregate these things? So the, the, that's like a philosophical question. Like, do you agree with that, that the framework? Is that resonate or is it you think about it differently? And, and more concretely, if you could standardize just one thing, like if, if I were to say like, okay, you have five minutes and you can only standardize one thing, what, what item would you ask for people to standardize? I guess to answer the last question, I, I, one of the biggest challenges that that any meta analysis faces, and and that and that ours has too, is is the many different ways people report estimates and their measures of uncertainty. And I think that that's that's an area that doesn't require a lot of consensus building on how to standardize that. There additional additional information can be reported um, that that would make it pretty straightforward to standardize them. Other areas I think are a lot harder about what what kinds of information do you need about interventions and outcomes because they vary so much. Um, and although there is variation in the kinds of estimation procedures and quantities of interest that people are interested in across disciplines, it's, it's I think it's an area where standardizing would would help us all out a lot. Yeah, I, I I think that's right. I also um I'll make a plug for the interventions and outcomes as well. That's something uh when we are first going through the uh metadata schema that Graham referenced earlier, um we spent a long time on because there's a few ways that you can do it. You can either try to list out every single intervention everyone has ever done and probably Fernando, as you're saying, we're going to get brand new interventions every time we have a new study, um, or you can try to put them into these large groups of, you know, are are they doing roughly the same thing to try to move human behavior? Um, and when you start doing that, you run into the question of, are we grouping these too large? Is this actually going to be useful to anyone? Um, and so while uh, it is, I think, really important because we want to get to the point where you have these cells where you can easily say, you know, these are the training interventions and we want to know how they affect X, Y, Z outcomes. Um, there's a lot of standardization that needs to be done in terms of how we think about interventions and how we think about outcomes. Yeah, I'd agree on the kind of most feasible front. There's a lot of really low hanging fruit of um, we could get really standardized reporting of things like the mean for the control group or the standard deviation. So I think that's something that's very feasible and would be very helpful to have. Kind of more ambitious, longer term, maybe uh, it would be nice to have something with the cost to be able to understand, okay, if we want to move something by this treatment effect size, how much do we have to pay to really be able to compare? Uh, but then we get into the issue of how are treatments defined, uh, how are the kind of mechanisms, all of that, which becomes really harder to standardize. So maybe not feasible, but nice. I mean, this is a good point to open up to the floor and see, hear other people's perspectives, questions, things that people would like to discuss in this area. So you've all been talking about efforts to average across studies, conduct meta-analysis. Can you comment on the risks that are posed to that effort if the original results are tainted by p-hacking or fraud? I guess I would say one of one of the goals of of the standards is to report on what was the research design, um, and and I think we've talked in a number of ways about linking registrations to the final papers. And if you have a clear statement of what the research design is, including the hypotheses and the estimation procedure in the registration and in the final study, then it uncovers these. And so j simply by providing some some transparency there, obviously there are are issues in doing that. But I think there there has been, um, yeah, I, I, yeah, that's what. I was. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say p-hacking uh, is always a risk and it's mitigated, like Graham said, by having that robust um, like PAP registration, pre-registration infrastructure. Um, what I, I have been kind of pushing on for every time that we talk about um, what fields do we need to include in a particular schema when we have something that people want to look at is just linkages. 
um we are getting better at having this like full infrastructure of you've got your registrations you've got your paps you've got your paper your reports your irb application etc um but if i actually wanted to go back and link all of those together as i think fernando is finding right now uh it's very difficult um and so being able to go to a place and be able to see that um, there's a PAP, these were the hypotheses for it, and then this is the treatment effect that went into this meta-analysis. I, I think that'd be a big step forward. Um, Lars uh, Villahuber, so I'm somewhat really, my bias is involved in this, so uh, I was on that co-author list that uh, Jack had. Um, one of the possible things that I think is missing in the landscape that you sort of put out there. We're talking about the producers of the data, the folks running the actual trials out in the field and stuff like that. We're talking about you guys as consumers of this. We want to do something with it. But the actual beneficiaries of this are actually, going back to uh, skip stuff, the policymakers that actually want to consume the summary that you're trying to build based on the summary of stuff that's out there. And to some extent, one possible alternative is you need a journal of summaries of trials that has specific studies that follow a certain reporting pattern because journals do have this option to sort of require a certain format in the way that they actually structure their actual journals and stuff like that. Um, and so figuring out who is the producer of that intermediate product that then gets you the feedback loop that you need about are our reporting standards actually useful for policy relevant studies in a variety of contexts. So studying, I don't know, deworming across the world, meta studies since TED stuff or whatever, is one study that gets published. And that doesn't need to be a big study. If you look at sort of medical literature, medical abstracts are often just repeated every five years just to update what was there before. That's not particularly glamorous in the social sciences in terms of us getting publications. But it might be that missing ingredient is that there needs to be a publication outlet for all this stuff that allows then other people to just say, awesome, interesting, but I have this thing that I'd like to add in there. And you accumulate that over time, et cetera. So there's something in there that provides the incentives to link all these things together. Thoughts? I mean, that wasn't in sort of what you were laying out, but any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think one of the issues, like you mentioned, is that there isn't really this incentive always uh, to be doing the meta-analysis, to be translating the work from kind of more technical to making it really policy relevant. Uh, so it's hard and obviously not trivial uh, to be able to increase incentives to do meta-analyses, to do things like replication. But one of the things that maybe is easier uh, to kind of move the needle on is to reduce the cost of that. So to the extent that we can have things standardized so that meta-analyses can be done um, much easier, maybe even if the incentives aren't increased there, if the cost is at least lower to people, that could um, allow for these studies to be done more often or to be updated more frequently. Um, I can briefly put my j -Pal hat on to, to answer part of that question. Uh, so one of the things that, that the j -Pal policy team, which I'm not on, but have respect for, um, does is create short evaluation summaries of every RCT that j -Pal does uh, for policymakers. So the idea is it's a digestible read. It's highly structured. Every single one has the same exact se sections. I've gone through the guidance. It's like 17 pages long. Um, and it says exactly what you want to say in each one. Um, and so there is some uh, structure uh, on, on kind of the uh, translating evidence to policymakers side. But I think Lars, you're right on we're missing that step of going from kind of the ad hoc um, policymaker summary to a, a more robust meta analysis on these things. And I think that's where ideal, where the reporting standards could lower the cost a lot so that it's not this huge uh, unmanageable task that only the most well-resourced labs could do a meta analysis that bring in all the studies on XYZ intervention for, for ABC outcome. Yeah, and, and if I can jump in, the, the, I think that one highly desirable feature of this journal or or, or uh, uh, outlet to 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 summarize this information should be also to have some some type of prescription of how to be up, how it should be updated 
uh, because I, I don't know when you're talking about I was thinking of the Journal of Economic Perspectives that once every I don't know 10 or 15 years provides like a very nice summary on certain literatures but like it's very hard to know how how th that summary applies applies to setting, settings different from the US uh, times uh, 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 like over time, when when the evidence becomes invalid, it just expires. Those are things that we just don't talk so much. And having that type of prescriptions in would be, from my perspective, very helpful. But sorry, I took it. Somebody was raising the, the hand. Ah, online, online, great, yeah. All right, this is um, from the Q&A on the Zoom chat. The question is, is standardized reporting a threat to science funding? Um, what if we find out that most papers published repeat the same thing and that most of them say nothing new? Um, the question is, what is beneficial for policy can sometimes be detrimental for uncovering pseudoscience. And do you have any comments on this? I don't think it's detrimental. I think it's like a, a huge reason to do this work. We, it's really hard to do meta research right now across big literatures because we don't have the findings and the study designs in a in a standard data that that um, that researchers can use in lots of different ways to uncover methodological flaws. L lots of the research on research design in the last few years, I think, in in economics and political science and other fields, has been it has been made possible because people have collected databases of every p value reported in any economics journal, um, and every every um, uh, the power of every study in in political science. And so I think these 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 complementary efforts are I, I think feeding into rooting out bad research, but, and also uh, enabling researchers who are trying to do impactful science to communicate to the public that that's what they're doing. Yeah, I would just say that I, I think Skip covered that question better than I could in his presentation. So, Hi, I'm Stuart Buck with The Good Science Project. Um, apologies if any of you covered this already, but I wonder to what extent standardization of reporting would be helped by trying to standardize the underlying measures that are being used in the first place, whether it's surveys or tests and so forth. And I don't know the, the fields you're working on quite as well, but I've seen this in multiple other fields. So in psychology, for example, there's this researcher named Malte Elson, I think he's in Switzerland. Like for a while he had this website called flexiblemeasures.com. Um, and he reported that in this area of psychological research, measuring aggression, he said there were more ways of measuring aggression reported in the literature than there were papers in the literature <laughs> at, the, at the time he put out this website. So literally people came up with their own survey instruments and their own scales, you know, Likert scales and their own ways of dichotomizing, all, all these different ways of measuring something. So they're all pur purportedly studying the same thing and yet more ways of measuring it than there were papers. So kind of astonishing. Um, so he, he published this paper last year called State, something like psychological measures should not be like toothbrushes. Basically like everybody has their own, like don't use somebody else's. Um, and, and then similarly medicine, there's been the COMET initiative, which stands for something like core outcomes measurement, something, something ET. Um, but it's, a, it's an attempt to standardize that you know, if you're going to study a particular kidney disease in a clinical trial, here's the here's the number one thing you should measure and exactly how you should measure it. Like, don't come up with your own test, don't come up with your own scale. Like, measure it in a particular way, and then you can talk about standardizing the outcome reporting and so forth. Yeah, I think one of the issues uh, that Fernando brought up is that every time someone publishes, they're trying to not just move it incrementally, they want to be able to say, I have new methodology, new approach, new data, new results, um, which is partly kind of the fault of the fields we're in um, and what they incentivize and what gets published. Uh, so I think that's part of the issue, uh, but it is really difficult to standardize also when we don't necessarily have a consensus on what the best um, method is or what the best kind of thing to report is. So I think it's sort of balancing, incentivizing people to be able to replicate or to use the same methodology or measure, but also trying to figure out what is kind of the optimal one to use. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree that a, a, a decent proportion of the problem is is kind of the need to say, hey, I'm measuring this new thing in a new way. Um, but I also think that a proportion of the lack of standardized outcomes in the social sciences is just 
people not being able to access survey instruments or, or other data collection instruments that um, other teams have used. I, I think there's like the other things that we're talking about right now, not a great consensus on when you publish a replication package, when you publish your uh, paper, making those very easily available to other um, researchers. One of the things that we're working on right now, j that I'm, I'm really excited about is creating a, a bank of survey instruments so that you can uh, like look up at the question level what people have asked about a certain thing. And then hopefully, I don't know if that would help towards um, towards Allison's point on, you know, we, we want new, but it would help on this other point of, oh, maybe we should uh, measure this thing. Uh, I don't know how other people have done that. It probably wouldn't be too hard to just create my own question. I'm a big fan of outcome standardization. I've been involved in a couple of multi-site studies that that basically tried to select the same set of outcomes in addition to the same set of, of interventions. Um, and I, th I think it really contributed to the credibility of the studies because we could isolate the fact that there was not measure there were not measurement differences in addition to contextual differences. One of the challenges that that we faced in both of those efforts is that when when you're a researcher who's working in each one of those contexts, um, you have an idea about how to best measure this concept in that context. Um, and you have a set of people that are trying to standardize them. And so you come into contact, you come into this tension of um, measuring the same thing and making sure that you're measuring with fidelity the concept that you're that you're measuring in each. Um, so I feel like there's been a lot of interesting progress in in, in that area. For ideal, we're trying to collect um, both an outcome category, which which might be standard across, and then also a measure of what, or, or also a um, what is the specific measurement tool that was used and a citation for it, uh, so that we can at least track um, in in the area that we're working in who's who's using these common measurement tools, and maybe that would lead to um, people focusing on 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 the ones that that have been adopted widely. But I think that's a kind of ambitious uh, idea. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for the very interesting panel so far. Um, I think I'm extending on the psychologist's scare about study quality. Um, being currently involved in a meta-analysis as well, we see that the uh, mixture of paper mills and large language models is really terrifying to study qualities and what is out there. And I was wondering if you have any perspectives based on all this evidence you're gathering on how to assess study quality in a robust manner as the field of study quality assessments is again a mess. And uh, we are struggling a lot with um, choosing between the probably 20 different standards. Um, yeah, and it would really be helpful to uh, hear your opinions on this matter. And, and just to add a little, like, um... Uh, maybe I'm the one who recently learned the concept of paper mills, but probably people know it here, but this, this idea of a uh, somewhat fake journal generating uh, paper uh, papers, uh, uh, publishing papers for hire. Uh, so it, the, what his point is that the, the, now there's a ginormous amount of papers that there's not even actual peer review. Yeah, that that's a good point. Um, it's a tough question. Um, uh, for the registry side, which which Graham just recommended talking about, um, we do like a, a certain level of, um, manual review of every registration that comes into the registry just to make sure it meets certain standards. Now, if someone did a very good registration about a study that you just like completely didn't plan on running, that's not something that we would be able to you know verify. But it is. Um, it is possible to have like at least one level of manual review that does weed out a lot of studies that just like aren't in scope or don't provide enough information on X, Y, Z thing. Um, in terms of like how, how we deal with quality on, on the back ends, that's something that we talk a lot about for the metadata schema. And, uh, it kind of turned into, there are certain things that 
we can ask people to report like the level of attrition, the, the, the extent of compliance with the trial, and then we can give that information to people who might be using the database and let them make their own definitions of what quality is uh, according to their standards. I don't have a good answer for that, but I do feel like a really positive development in meta analysis practice in the last few years has been kind of conditioning on research design quality. There's a long tradition of including all studies on, on a given topic and looking at how effects vary by research design. Um, and I think that, that that's really poisonous because it's 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 allowing low quality research designs to to be at the same uh, at the same level of standing as as high quality research designs. And how we interpret the difference in those findings is is kind of irrelevant. We should be throwing away the the low quality ones. Um, I don't. I, I hadn't thought about paper mills a lot, so I'd love to love to hear about some of the the methods that are being developed to uh, to identify and and remove those. Um, I think our answer is in the ideal project is similar, which was we're doing a kind of manual review, which hopefully would catch a lot, but I imagine not all of them. Um, I think we're uh, on time. So the, the there, I think there was one last question. One last question. Yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you. It's just real quick. So uh, for Jack and Lars, that if you get a chance to do your RCT again, uh, one thing that we know is that coercive nudges work better than incentive nudges. And so you might not want to do this and people would probably be uh, mad at you if you did it, but but I, I know that you'll get a big treatment effect if you uh, if the notification said we're going to disclose that you didn't follow through on reporting to some group that you care about, like your department or your subfield, or even just have a list of names of people who didn't do it. And I like, I, kn I know you, you, you probably don't want to do it, but if you did do it, you'd get a big treatment effect. I, I guarantee you that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good suggestion. Um, I think that might be for later on in the process if we can't get uh, better pull measures like uh, journals requiring it. All right, with that, I'll ask for an applause for the great panel. Yes.